Welcome to our ProSignal live program. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kai Taylor, and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you might have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A polling window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the top where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. During this presentation, you will see multiple choice polling questions throughout the event. When a poll is active, it will automatically appear in the Q&A polling window. To participate in the polls, please select the buttons to the left of the answer that best represent your views and or experiences. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Sam Joel, for opening remarks. Sam, the floor is yours. A very good morning, afternoon, or evening to you, wherever you may be. And thank you very much for joining us in this second in this series of webinars focused on the utility of ProSigna a second generation genomic slash transcriptomic test based on the PAM50 gene signature. We hope you find this and subsequent events useful and insightful, and a lot of work has been put in to make them relevant to your practice. As a technician has already described, this is an interactive session and we would warmly welcome any and all questions and your feedback. And I would encourage you to use Slido to communicate with us and we'll have an open Q and A at the end of the session. If you weren't able to join us for the first session, my name is Sam Joel, and I'm the Medical Affairs Director for Veris Light in Europe, where I provide medical and scientific support to the community, helping to improve understanding and access to genomic testing for breast cancer patients. I'm part of a wider team, and we're here to help you, whether your question is clinical, scientific, or access related. The aim of this webinar series is to demonstrate the clinical utility of price signal by building on our previous discussions in a narrative fashion. So following the first meeting hosted by Professor Kelly Markham, summarizing the key data and demonstrating the clinical utility of ProSigna, today we will switch our attention to the discovery of PAM50 and the development of the assay into the product that we now refer to as ProSigna. So to facilitate this discussion, we have assembled a truly stellar lineup of speakers for you. Professor Charles or Chuck Perry, Professor Torsten Nielsen, and Dr. Martina Kirshner. Professor Peru is the main Goldman Shaw Distinguished Professor of Molecular Oncology and Co-Director of the UNC Computational Medicine Programme and Professor in Sir Frank Lee Dizzy, having published over 470 peer-reviewed articles which have been cited uh, a mind-boggling 210,000 times. Professor Peru will take us through the early years of discovery in this field in relation to the underlying biology of breast cancer. Torsten Nielsen is a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of British Columbia. After complete, completing the combined MD PhD program at McGill, he undertook training in England, Stanford and the Cleveland Clinic before taking a position as a clinician scientist and surgical pathologist, specializing in sarcomas and breast cancer. In breast cancer, Professor Nielsen has published a series of well-cited studies applying molecular subtyping biomarkers onto large tissue microarray series. In doing so, he has worked to improve and standardize immunohistochemical tests for estrogen receptor, basal biomarkers, and importantly, KI67, the latter as part of a dedicated international consortium. Professor Nielsen will take us from the foundational work and describe how this technology was developed and translated into the FDA cleared, internationally distributed tests we now refer to as ProSigna. Martina Kirshner is a scientific assist assistant at the Center for Molecular Pathology at the Institute of Pathology in Heidelberg in Germany. She received her docu doctorate in molecular anthropology from Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. She specializes in molecular pathology and is responsible for the technical management of gene expression analyses, i.e. ProSigna at the Center for Molecular Pathology. Her research interests include the influence of immune cells in the tumor microenvironment on therapeutic response in a variety of tumor sites. Dr. Kirshner will take us through how her institution has implemented this technology from a practical perspective, demonstrating the journey of this sign, this sign from the lab bench to bedside. So without further ado, I'd like to thank our speakers and you, the audience, for joining us 
and give the floor over to Professor Parikh. Thank you, Sam. And, uh, and others are here. Let's see if I can advance the presentation. Oops. I'll keep going here. And so today we'll, we'll give a, a history and sort of the utility of, of the ProSigna assay. It's my pleasure to be able to give the introduction um, as to uh, the history uh, behind the development of PAM50 and ProSigna. Uh, and as you'll see, uh, and as is illustrated in, in this slide, it actually spans many different technologies. Uh, but what I always say is uh, it's, it's uh, robust gene expression plat patterns are platform independent, and certainly the nanostring platform is, is an outstanding platform. Uh, here are my disclosures. Of course, I have a conflict of interest with uh, with with Verisite here, being one of the inventors and and co-developers of that. And so, my university requires me to, to point that out. Um, and whoops, I think I is this the first slide? Forgive me. Oh, yeah, it is. So. Uh, let me just go back. I'll, I'll just start here, right? So as you can imagine, today we're going to cover many different publications. Uh, there's an extensive and rich history uh, of publications for, PAM, for what are starting with intrinsic subtypes, then transitioning to PAM50, and then transitioning to ProSigna. And you will, you will see that development uh, through the talks today. Uh, here are some of the first publications Again, the first uh, three there are about intrinsic subtypes. Uh, and then we start to talk about the development of PAM50 and, and what was the motivation for the development of that. And then of course we transition to the clinically robust platform. Uh, and throughout the talk, we'll be showing you a number of Kaplan-Meier survival plots. In this case, uh, indicating that your subtype, your PAM50 subtype uh, is, is prognostic. And this will be a reoccurring theme over the course of today where luminal A's do best and then the other subtypes do worse. So this really began with this paper, which was my the culmination of my work uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University uh, in the laboratory of David Botstein. Uh, I was also fortunate at the time that David and had worked very closely with Pat Brown, Pat Brown being one of the inventors of the cDNA microarray technology. And here you can see this uh, 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 picture of a cDNA microarray. Uh, actually, this was one of the first microarrays I actually personally made. Um, and, you know, of course, at the time, it was one of the most exciting technologies there ever was. Um, and and sort of the third partnership in this collaboration uh, was also with Annalisa Borenson Dale and Per Eistein Lanning uh, from Norway, who, who contributed scientifically as well as with some spectacular specimens uh, that you will see very shortly. So, this is really the first paper where we described intrinsic subtypes. So, let me hit the uh, advance button. And and one of the first somewhat surprising findings that we had, so in this paper, we had 22 pairs of tumor specimens, 20 before and after doxorubicin neoadjuvant chemotherapy, two tumor lymph node metastasis pairs. Here I'm showing you the dendrogram from an unsupervised hierarchical cluster analysis where the vast majority of these paired samples or samples from the same person grouped right next to one another. Right. And, and this, again, at the time was very surprising to us because we figured, oh, before and after neoadjuvant chemotherapy would have a dramatic effect. Well, the answer is it did have an effect. However, the individuality, the unique gene expression patterns of each tumor is always dominate. Right. And, and this led to this, to us and others saying, you know, every tumor is in a class by itself. Every tumor is unique. And so here's where we call these samples actually intrinsic pairs. 
And, and actually we exploited this pairing uh, to search for genes that showed low variance within a pair, but high variance across pairs. So this gave us the intrinsic gene list, which then allowed us to, to identify the intrinsic subtypes, right? So technically speaking, the intrinsic gene list comes from a supervised analysis. But in this case, we're looking for things basically that don't vary within a person, but vary across different individuals. Now, when we apply this list to a larger sample set here, so now we've increased the number of these pairs significantly, including adding in autopsy patient specimens from autopsy patients where there's a primary tumor and then multiple metastases. And this theme continues to hold up. So in this case, here's a primary tumor and, and many metastases from all different sites, actually from two different people. So in some ways, it doesn't matter if the tumor lands in the liver or, or in the lung or in the brain, it still has that unique signature of having arisen from that common uh, uh, primary tumor and the patterns of that tumor still, still, still dominate. So this really gave ter rise to the term molecular portraits, right? Your gene expression pattern of a tumor or a group of tumors that are derived from each other is so distinctive, it's as, as distinctive as a picture of an individual or, or, or a painting. So I think the other key finding from this first nature paper was the identification basically of the intrinsic subtypes, which if we look at this dendrogram, you know, on the far left, we had the basal-like subtype, which, you know, again, at the time was, was quite unexpected. Uh, then next to it in kind of purple here is the HER2 enriched subtype. Then we have the normal likes, and then we have the luminals. And actually in this original publication, largely due to the small sample size, we didn't get separation in the luminal A versus B. But nonetheless, we identified this HER2 enriched subtype and most importantly, the basal-like subtype. So jump forward a few years, we keep improving our sample size. In this case, it's now 78. Uh, before and after treatment pairs predominantly. Uh, reassuringly, we basically see the same overall patterns. Uh, and now we get a separation of luminal A uh, and luminal B. And one of the key additions from this paper was this is the first paper to show prognostic differences of the subtypes for both relapse-free survival and overall survival, pointing out that the luminal A's do best and that the other, you know, three subtypes, basically HER2 enriched, basal-like, luminal B do significantly worse. Uh, this data, I should point out, is pre-trasduzumab. Uh, and so before trasduzumab, the HER2 enriched subtype is potentially was the worst, the worst prognostic group. Uh, that's now changed, fortunately, thanks to the addition of trasduzumab. So now we jump forward uh, a few more years. And actually, for me, this was, this was one of the most important papers uh, uh, in some ways of my career. This was one of the, this was probably the first entirely computational paper that I did. And what we did in this paper was to take an ever expanding uh, uh, data set of our own on the left. But then we also got a microarray, Affymetrics microarray data set from our colleagues at Duke. Uh, and then the famous NKI data set from Laura Vandeveer and colleagues uh, uh, from the Netherlands. We applied our, our methodology and we found common subtypes across these three different data sets. And not only did we find common subtypes, but they also had common outcomes, right? So this showed the reproducibility of these gene expression platforms on three different technologies and the, and the prognostic common findings on two different data sets. So this gave us uh, 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 confidence that these gene expression subtypes were real, reproducible, and potentially of clinical benefit. And so here's where uh, we then had a great collaboration 
sparked by this NCI specs grant uh, between my lab, uh, Torsten's lab, uh, Matt Ellis, uh, uh, at the time who was at Wash U, along with Elaine Martis, and then Phil Bernard at the University of Utah, where we all sat down and put our heads together to come up with a single sample predictor of the intrinsic subtypes. And, and previous to this, you, you would have to do hierarchical cluster analysis and, to do classifications. And, and that's not a single sample predictor because if you take out one sample or add 10 samples, the, the cluster changes slightly. So we wanted to come up with an unchanging predictor. And, and I'll show you a little bit about how we did that, but basically the way the PAM50 subtyper works and the way the ProSignus subtyper now works is for each of the five uh, groups that we're interested in, we have an idealized profile for each of the five. Whoops. Um, a new sample comes in, is then uh, compared to each of the five groups, uh, and then assigned to the subtype that it's most similar to. Uh, so we did this uh, in a statistically robust way. So we have a new training set. We used a method called SIGCLUS to actually identify the statistically significant groups in the cluster analysis. Uh, we then uh, performed cross-validation analysis to, analyze, to, 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 to analyze ever smaller versions of this gene list. So we started with 2000 genes. You know, at the time it was hard to measure 2000 genes. There was no sequencing, right? There was no next gen based sequencing. Uh, we so we decided to do things by quantitative PCR. So we needed a smaller list. Uh, so we shrunk the list. I've been, I've been asked this question many times. So here you can kind of look at the black line which is the cross validation accuracy of all of them according to different size lists. So at five genes, you know, some distinctions can be done, basal versus not basal. Other distinctions are, are poorly done. 50 genes was kind of the sweet spot of accuracy of, the, of, of identifying each of the subtypes, but also having a small, a small and manageable list. So we used 50 genes, developed it by quantitative PCR, and then used the nearest centroid prediction method. Uh, we then applied this 50 gene predictor onto a data set of 710 node negative patients who received no systemic adjuvant treatment, uh, did multivariable analysis, and determined that even if you know ER status uh, grade and nodal status, that the PAM50 subtypes add additional information. And then if you actually include stage and subtype, uh, it's even more prognostic than subtype or stage alone. So that led to the motivation of the risk score uh, or the ROR score, uh, which was also motivated by the fact that some samples, for example, look exactly halfway between a luminal A and a luminal B. So what do you call those? Well, in terms of risk, we figured out we could give them a quantitative score where uh, what we did was a Cox proportional hazards model training from a particular data set where the coefficients or the, the features in the model are basically a sample's distance to each of the set subtypes. Um, and then we also included a term for tumor size, uh, thereby combining the pathology features and the genomics into a common predictor. So we also had to identify some cut points. So from the training set here, you can see the risk score range of scores by subtype and basically pick the cutoff where, as you can see, it was pretty easy where basically no luminal A or very few luminal A's were in the high risk group and very few, if any, basal, HER2 enriched, or luminal B were in the low risk group. Uh, this does a very good job of, of predicting quantitative outcomes. Uh, what we could also then did was to show you can, you can, you can plot this uh, in a way where on the y-axis you have your probability of relapse at five years, and on the x-axis is your risk score, and there's a near linear relationship. 
So we can say to patients with great precision that you have a 20% probability or a 30% probability. Uh, instead of saying you're high risk, you're low risk, we, we provide both of those pieces of information. We of course then wanted to compare this to other features like grade. So we did, <clears throat> excuse me, C-index testing to look at how we could potentially improve things. So here's the C-index model with, you know, tumor size, ER, and grade alone. If the subtype alone model did better than the pathology variables alone. Subtype plus tumor size did even better. And then subtype plus tumor size plus grade, adding grade was an incremental improvement and, and basically didn't add to the model. So that's where we stopped, right? We didn't add grade to the model. But the, at this point, the best model was subtype plus tumor size. So I think that's my last slide. And I will, I will stop there and then turn it over to my colleague and friend, Torsten. Chuck, thank you so much for that fascinating insight. It's, I think it's difficult to overstate the importance of that work for all breast cancer patients globally. So I think thank you on behalf of the entire community. If, uh, I believe the polling question is currently displaying. Uh, so if uh, the audience could take a moment or two to, uh, to vote on the question of, do you currently use intrinsic subtyping to guide your treatment decisions? So if we'll, we'll just give it a minute or two for the, uh, the answers to come in, if that's okay, folks. Okay, there's a, there's a few responses coming in here. Um, I'll just give it another five or 10 seconds. We have about 60, 40 split in favor of uh, the use of intrinsic subtyping guiding uh, treatment decisions. So uh, an interesting mix there. Uh, Thorsten, the floor is yours. Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sam and everyone. Um, welcome. Um, it's early in the morning for me, uh, end of the day for many of you, I think. Um, I'm uh, Torsten, I'm a clinician scientist pathologist uh, based in Vancouver, and I am one of the inventors of the uh, PAM50 and, and Persigna test. And I first met Chuck actually when he was presenting this, this beautiful microarray data on the intrinsic subtypes that you just heard about um, at the same conference I was at. It was the uh, AACR conference in San Francisco in 2000. And in their wisdom, the conference secretariat had looked at this data, which ended up on the front cover of Nature and textbook knowledge for breast cancer ever since. And they'd given Chuck a poster. And um, I was the guy who was lucky enough to um, be on the other aisle, uh, across the aisle from his poster. So I met him during setup, actually. We, we chatted a bit and probably laid the foundations of what became a successful collaboration. And then they opened the doors to the uh, session and there was a flood of people. Uh, everyone wanted to see Chuck's poster, hundreds and hundreds of people. You know, he was a rock star. He's a tall man. You can't tell that from on Zoom. I'm also tall. So I could kind of see him across this crowd of people uh, while the ones at the back were hopping up and down trying to see anything, at which point they realized they had no choice but to turn around and look at my poster. So I got lots of business that day. Uh, and then I also decided to stop working on pancreatic cancer and maybe turn my attention to breast cancer. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Chuck realized that uh, these beautiful genomic sequences, if we wanted to have them make sense for patients, we needed to transfer from a relatively expensive information dense technology to something more practical that just answers clinical questions. And our first attempt to do this was by immunistic chemistry. And as a pathologist, I was a natural partner for him on this. And so we together put together a paper trying to convert that large gene list just to a simple immunistic chemistry profile. And that paper ended up massively cited. It, to date, it, it may still be, it was for a long time, the most widely cited paper in the history of the journal Clinical Cancer Research because it showed that you could do something quick and easy with as few as six antibodies approximate these uh, intrinsic subtypes. And I went back to a very large um, Canadian series with long-term follow-up and working with Chuck, we were able to 
define um, at a high level uh, a lot of the clinical features of these subtypes, including that if you're HER2 or basal, you have lots of events over the first three to five years, but if you follow people out, they're largely cured if they get past that point, whereas the luminal patients continue at being at risk for events over a long period of time, uh, higher risk with luminal B than luminal A. But as many of you know, immunistic chemistry certainly has limitations. Lots of QC issues still plague us, even for things like ER and HER2. It doesn't, it's low plex in terms of the number of analytes. They're not quantitative. And the net result out of this is a relatively poor capacity, well, limited capacity to make an accurate subtype. 70 to 80% accurate by IHC after years of trying to make it as good as possible. That net level is good enough to make these epidemiological correlations with confidence, but it's not good enough if you're going to be making a life or death decision on a single patient. And that's why we moved to a gene profile, as Chuck described, a list of 50 genes at first by qPCR. And I was involved in one of the large validation studies applying this test in its original version onto many of these cases where we had the IHC and the long-term follow-up data to get external validation of subtyping and ROR modeling, and to see if it would work even on low quality, older FFPE specimens with direct comparison to IHC. And in this paper, I wanna call your attention at the bottom, another one of these C index plots, showing you that these um, risk models are better than immunistic chemistry for sure. And if you look at the top also where these arrows are, it's only the, the gene profiling model that can pick out a really ultra low risk group with virtually no events way out to 15 years. Whereas IHC can make prognostic distinctions, but you can't pick out a super low risk group with that approach. So at this point, we knew we could do this on paraffin blocks, these PAM50 results, subtyping, and we could assign a risk of relapse score applicable on ER positive women who are treated with uh, five years of adjuvant endocrine therapy. And in doing so, we could pick out this ultra low risk group and that we were getting more information doing a better job than clinical data or immunistic chemistry. Um, Chuck wanted me to mention that this also uh, led us to, with some final refinements, settling on a final model, which incorporates these 50 genes um, and a, a little bit of extra weighting for proliferation genes in the final model, as well as including tumor size to create our optimal risk score model. And that's what we had locked down, published, and we're ready to take into a, a clinical test and going for FDA clearance because the, the grant that had funded us uh, from the NIH, it was a major grant, but it was time limited. And their mandate was at the end of this, you guys should be taking this to the FDA and trying to turn this into a clinical test. So we consulted with them. Uh, we heard about how we had to do formal proof of analytical validity and clinical validity in a, in a, in a very careful good laboratory practices approach if we were going to get regulator approval to make a multi-site distributed test, not just one of these LDTs you could and run in your own shop only, but a truly distributed test. And at this point, we took a risk because although we'd worked with PCR, and that's the technology that to this day is still used by, for example, Oncotype or Enderpredict, we decided to jump to a new technology platform that was invented down the road for me uh, in Seattle um, because the nanostring system had a lot of advantages, we thought, for a distributed test. And you'll hear a little bit more from the, about this from Martina, but I'm going to quickly just go through the technology very briefly. If you want to measure an RNA in a specimen, what you do is you design a complementary probe to a unique sequence in that. But with nanostring technology, you break that probe in half uh, into, say, a capture half that is tagged with biotin and a reporter half that has a fluorescent barcode. That will be your probe pair for one gene, but you actually make a soup, in this case, for all 50 genes plus a number of controls. It's called your code set. And you'll hybridize that overnight with your RNA sample such that uh, if there's one copy of your template, and it can be poor quality, highly degraded template, okay, but it will still work for this. It will create a tripartite structure bringing together the capture and reporter probes. You wash away everything that's unbound. The biotin part makes it stick to an avid encoded cartridge. An electric current makes it lie down nice and flat so it can be read by the digital analyzer, which just counts barcodes. So um, one signal means one copy of RNA. There's no enzymes. There's no amplification. Errors don't get amplified. Um, it's a very robust technology. It's a digital readout. And then those digital counts for each of the genes you'd measure, which would go to a list of 50 plus controls here, gets put into the PAM50 algorithm we developed to give you a subtype and an ROR score. 
Um, my, my colleague, Dr. Kirshner, will go through the workflow a little bit, but suffice it to say at this point, we had to lock down the workflow and the process and then do a formal analytical validity study that was FDA audited uh, to see whether we could uh, safely distribute this test. The question here being, if we had the same specimen from the same woman, if we run our test over and over and over again, are we gonna get the same result over and over and over again? Even if it's run on a different day of the week with a different reagent lot by a different operator in a different city, are we getting the same result? This is kind of boring for a scientist to do, but obviously it's incredibly important if you're going to be using a clinical test in practice. Um, this was an audited protocol to this day, and I could almost point the camera at it. I have the locked cabinet beside me with all the original data. I've been forced to bring it out at least once since that time. It was run as a formal registry study. So like a clinical trial, we had to fully pre-specify our metrics for success and amount of assay variability that would not lead to um, clinical errors in decision making. So that was a, a value of four in, the, in, in this particular study. We beat that easily for precision targeting. So this was uh, critical data showing that the assay was analytically reproducible with all process variables across multiple test sites. And in fact, the degree of precision we obtained in a distributed format was at a level that most tests could only achieve in a centralized format, reflecting the robustness of the underlying nanostring-based technology. And this was half of the data that we needed to show, for example, to FDA, Health Canada, European Union, and, and subsequent other jurisdictions that this was a safe test that should be cleared. Again, only half the battle. The other half of the battle is the clinical validity. Now, it turns out you can make level one evidence to show your test is clinically valid using existing archival material with long-term follow-up, something you need to do in the breast cancer space because it takes such a long time and hence prospective studies will take over a decade to run. You can do this if you follow very careful best practices, your fully validated lockdown defined test that doesn't change you fully pre-specify your analysis and writing. You work with the clinical trials group. There's independent statistical analysis to run the result. And if you show that your test links to outcome in those patients on that retrospective prospective series, if you will, you have to do it twice on a second series. So it is a high bar. What we sought out to do was to validate that finding I showed you earlier on this large Canadian cohort that you could identify an ultra low risk group and now do it on two clinical trials of women who were uh, ER positive, who had received five years of endocrine therapy. So these uh, two studies started with the, uh, a British study, the trans attack study, and neither Chuck nor I were involved in this work at all, a completely independent analysis. Um, they had a very high technical success rate on this material. And uh, just over half of the women in this study were flagged as low risk by our ROR, ProSigna score. At this time, we now are calling it ProSigna, the nanostring-based pound 50 assay. And indeed, it turned out when that data was sent to Britain, those were low risk. Uh, we called them low risk, and they turned out to have 96% 10-year relapse-free survival. Um, the registry study that I was a senior author on worked with an Austrian, the Austrian clinical trial group on a slightly different study, but still involved five years of endocrine therapy um, for these women. Uh, again, a registry study. And to meet the requirements of Austrian law, all the patients uh, who were still alive from this trial had to actually be individually reconsented for the reuse of their blocks for this incredible amount of work. We had to go back to the community hospitals in Austria, some of which hadn't stored things very carefully or high quality, but we ended up with almost 1,500 uh, patients uh, where their material was sent to Vancouver. I ran an ROR score and a subtype, sent that data back to Austria, crossed my fingers, and breathed a huge sigh of relief when we got this blue line across the top here that shows that the group that we called low risk, which was just over one third in this somewhat higher risk uh, series, uh, were indeed low risk, 97% 10 year relapse free survival. So at this point, uh, we had um, level one evidence uh, in, a, in a registry approach um, that we could take to healthcare regulators to show that we could pick out an ultra low risk group. Um, whose uh, level of risk was so low, there was no room for any benefit from chemotherapy, and that we could do this in a distributed format with high degree of precision. And this took 13 years of work, okay, uh, from the time that uh, we started, um, just to give you some idea. And, and although we'd actually worked on many hundreds of thousands of specimens before, once we started working with the FDA 
and trying to get formal clearance. It was another almost 4,000 specimens that had to be run. So this got our clearance. Uh, subsequently, we've been uh, worked our way into many guidelines, including ASCO guidelines, Medicare approval uh, for particular indications. Um, one of the subsequent studies I was involved with that I will mention was a, a Danish study. Um, I'm, I'm Canadian, but I have uh, Danish relatives that uh, helped me uh, work on this study. Um, and uh, this involved virtually all women in Denmark who had uh, developed breast cancer in, in a period in the early 2000s. Um, it showed the incredible high success rate technically on, on this material um, in, in Denmark with, and um, confirmed what we thought we'd be able to confirm on this independent validation that the group we called low risk were indeed low risk. Uh, they were low risk for long term, well after stopping endocrine therapy. But this study also included many node positive women, uh, women with one to three positive nodes. And this cumulative incidence plot uh, shows that uh, the group that we could call low risk by uh, ProSigna, um, even though they were had one to three positive nodes, were indeed low risk with a less than 5% risk after 10 years. Um, this is some of the body of data, and there are multiple other papers we don't have time to discuss today that have led to us getting uh, summarized uh, by multiple independent groups as having very high quality evidence uh, and strong evidence behind this. Um, as uh, will, will be mentioned, and uh, there, as you will no doubt know, there are other tests on the market that will address the same indication of uh, identifying a low risk group among ER positive women treated with endocrine therapy. Um, I would say that ProSigna has some particular advantages. As a distributed test, you can run it locally. Uh, it's inherently lower cost uh, based on the underlying technology and your ability to run it locally. Um, unlike, uh, and, and Oncotype and Mammoprint don't do that, if, if, you have a, if you're looking for a clearance by an independent health regulator, ProSigna has that. Oncotype and Predict do not have that. And uh, the Brits have independently looked at all these technologies and assessed ProSigna as the one with the best cost benefit value for information and magnitude of prognostic differences in the testing space. And that's part of the reason it's been adopted in many jurisdictions around the world. We have regulatory approval in the EU and 13 other jurisdictions with the test actively being used in many places now. Going forward, and this will be my last slide, um, we are working on prospective studies, which again take a long time in the breast cancer space. The Optima trial run out of the UK, but international study looking in node positive women. Um, it's considered now unethical to run these studies in, in node negative women as the question is considered is settled. Uh, these gene profiling technologies do identify a low risk group who don't need chemotherapy. So proving that in node positive women. Uh, can we also de-escalate radiation therapy in low-risk women? That's being assessed in a trial uh, based in Australia, but being run internationally. And I'm involved in a trial in Canada on whether we can actually decrease endocrine therapy in low-risk women. And there's uh, several other uh, prospective studies in, in uh, various accrual or uh, data gathering phases. So uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope uh, uh, to take some questions on that later, and I'll hand the floor back to Sam. Austin, thank you so much. Uh, you just uh, concisely summarised decades of work by dozens of people into 15 minutes, which is remarkable uh, in itself and testament to the work you've done. So thank you so much. Uh, the next question to our audience uh, is, it should be displayed now, how long do your gene expression test results take to arrive? Is that three to five days, five to seven days, seven to 10 days, 10 to 14 days or, or longer? Uh, so I'll just take a few moments to allow the uh, audience to answer that question and then, uh, and then we'll move on. A few results coming in already. 40% um, are three to five days, so presumably they're ProSigna users uh, or they're very close to some other facility. Um, and we have over a third of us uh, taking over two weeks. Um, so we'll, just, we'll just give this another another few seconds for a few more responses to uh, trickle in. Um, but yeah, more, more than 60% of the audience are taking more than, more than 10 days to get the results. And I think that's uh, <clears throat> the work that's been undertaken to distribute this test uh, could significantly shorten that, but uh, okay. Well, thank you. Thanks again, Professor Nielsen. Uh, Dr. Kirshner, uh, it, the floor is yours for you, to, uh, for you to take us through how you've implemented uh, ProSigma in your institution. So thank you. Yeah, 
Hello from my side. Um, I'm Martina. I'm a biologist and I will report about the adoption process in our lab. We are ProSigna users um, for five years now. And the next slide, please. And uh, for the risk assessment in luminal breast cancer, there are currently four gene expression tests available in Germany. And uh, one of these is the ProSigna assay, and it's the only test that can identify molecular subtypes. And it's a test that is locally available, is CE marked and FDA approved. So there are many advantages for us to use this test in our lab. Um, next, please. And what's another benefit? Um, since July of last year, we are able um, to, re to have reimbursement for the costs. And um, this is an innovation because before um, only the end product could be reimbursed from um, healthcare insurances. And uh, now uh, the implementation and responsibility lies with the pathologists. And um, for reimbursement, we have to comply with the following requirements. Um, we have to confirm that it's a primary invasive breast cancer, um, which is estrogen receptor positive and HER2 negative, and which is lymph node negative. And before the test is used, the patients must be informed by a specialist, which means an oncologist or a special uh, trained um, doctor. And this uh, information has to be, uh, for this information, has to be used, uh, information sheet, um, especially for, for these um, patients. Uh, next, please. So what are the special features of the ProSigna assay? Um, you get information about um, the molecular subtype, um, and this test is a second generation assay, which includes clinical and pathological features in an individual risk assessment. So um, we get also information about um, the individual patient's probability of distant recurrence within the next uh, 10 years. And um, the essay determines an ROR score, which is given as a value between 1 and 100. And this allows the patient to be assigned to an individual risk group, um, which could be a low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk group. So um, how are these findings um, generated? Next, please. Um, after performing the essay on a patient's test sample, um, a computational algorithm based on Pearson's correlation compares the normalized 50 gene expression profile for the patient's test sample to the prototypical expression profiles of the four breast cancer intrinsic subtypes. So the patient's test sample is assigned to the subtype with the highest Pearson correlation. And in addition to the intrinsic subtypes, the ProSigna assay combines the tumor size, the nodal status, and proliferation score um, for determination of the 10-year um, risk of risk current score. So um, what are the technical features of the ProSigna assay? Next, please. Um, as Thorsten also um, reported, um, we have a system um, which uses gene-specific probe pairs. Um, that hybridize directly to the mRNA sample in solution. So there's no amplification or cDNR conversion uh, um, required. And so um, we have a precise and robust and reproducible test. And um, we need no former um, master mixes or uh, fluidics um, to be um, assessed. So it's a very user-friendly workflow and you have a short hands-on time. Um, regularly, it's below um, 30 minutes. And because of these um, um, probe sets and this um, probe target complex, um, you can read out digital, so you can avoid um, read out um, errors. And uh, what's a further um, advantage is um, you have um, a very, very um, quick reporting time. Um, yeah, mostly 72 hours. Next, please. So what are the experiences in our lab and what's important to know before you start the ProSigna essay uh, in your own lab? So you have to know it's a three-day workflow. 
and um, this contains two overnight steps. Um, that's important to know. And in this three-day workflow, you have um, some uh, opportunities to interrupt this process. And uh, day one starts with the macro dissection of your um, sections, of your tumor sections, um, which could be um, digested. That's the first overnight step. Um, the second day starts with RNA isolation. And here you have again uh, the opportunity to interrupt this process. Um, otherwise, you start directly with your hybridization. That's the first, um, uh, the second overnight step. And then on day three, you can load uh, the samples on your prep station to access, uh, to, um, yeah, to remove um, excess products. And um, here is a second chance to interrupt this process. Otherwise, you go on your digital analyzer and um, you have um, your report uh, on hand the same day. Next, please. Um, yeah, but the actual work begins much earlier. Um, you have important questions to, to be answered um, because it's essential to have the right material and, to, and it's um, essential to have um, complete information about the sample. So you have to know um, the tumor size and the nodal status. That's uh, important because without this information, you can't run this um, test. And um, you have to check, um, is the material suitable for this test? Um, and is it available on site? So we have several senders um, from um, yeah, uh, institutions and um, to standardize and to simplify this process, we designed a request um, form where the senders can um, enter all patient information and we check this information. And um, so it's, it's very easy to, to simplify this um, process. And it's super important to document every step um, to be sure that um, everything is um, correct. Um, so for quality assurance, uh, yeah, it's double it's, um, important. So next, please. Um, yeah, after this, um, your workflow starts and uh, you're starting with a sectioning and H and E staining and the determination of the tumor cellularity. Um, this is performed by a pathologist in your institution. Um, and um, your pathologist has to check if it's an invasive breast carcinoma. And um, you should be sure that the tumor cellularity uh, is more than 10%. Um, we work with tissue sections of five to eight micrometers. Um, this works very well. Um, next, please. Yes, thank you. And um, we, use, we don't use um, razor blades as is um, written in this protocol. We use um, glass capillaries. It's much easier for us because we have to change um, the razor blades or the capillaries after each um, paraffin um, material. So it's easier for us to, to handle and it's much safer because um, you don't get cut in this, these sharp um, elements. Um, um, yeah, the material uh, after the micro dissection and uh, deparaffinization, um, it's um, important to uh, control your RNA concentration. Uh, in this protocol, it's recommended to use an spectrophotometer. Um, we use a fluorometer. It works very well. And um, the low uh, input material um, limit is uh, 10 nanograms per microliter. Um, and we don't use this Roche um, hand um, RNA isolation kit. Um, we use the semi-automated uh, semi, um, processing because it's much easier for us to standardize um, the sample um, handling. Next, please.
So um, then you're starting with your run planning. Um, you should be sure that you have um, the right samples and enough samples to start a run. Um, then you can set up the run set identification record in your web application and uh, prepare your sample, uh, samples and kit components. And there are several components. You have um, the plastic materials as piper tips and piercers. You have these prep plates um, for the um, um, uh, pipetting robot and the cartridges where the material is um, put in for the analyzer. And you have your code set and um, you have to check if the barcodes are the right and um, um, the material is uh, enough for the samples you want to process. Next, please. So um, after hybridization, all of the sample purification steps are automated on the prep station, as we heard before. And after this um, purification, you can um, give your cartridge in the digital uh, analyzer. And after this readout, you get a report. And um, how does this re uh, report look like? Next, please. So here's an example of, of one uh, patient we um, tested. You have in the left-hand side uh, the histopathological information. Thank you. And uh, the results of the immunohistochemistry. And that's what our report says. So we have here um, a subtype of uh, luminal A. And um, this means um, a low risk for this patient and um, the value for the ROR is 31. So um, it's a, a low risk patient and it fits very well to the um, histopathological information on to the immunohistochemistry. So this means this patient don't need a chemotherapy. Next, please. So we're performing this test since uh, five years and um, we have faced some experiences. So I want to show you some uh, examples for this. The first one is um, from everyday life. So <laughs> um, sometimes um, show that appearance can deceive. Um, here we measured a good RNA concentration, but um, we still received an error message in our um, device and it tells us that the RNA concentration is too low and we were wondering why. And if we check the FFPE material, we can see that it's very um, inked and uh, the mes message for you is um, avoid inked areas during macro dissection because um, this ink um, is fluorescent and uh, is, will, will disturb your um, your uh, performance. Next, please. Another pro problem we um, sometimes um, um, experience is um, that fixation artifacts interfere with the immunohistochemistry. Here is an example. Um, this patient uh, had an um, had two expression of uh, zero and uh, the key 67. Um, immunohistochemistry couldn't uh, give a, a clear result. So the um, pathologist asked us to perform this ProSigna assay because um, there's no chance to get a, a good immunohistochemistry uh, result. So we performed the ProSigna assay. Next, please. And um, find out that this patient is a uh, HER2 enriched um, subtype with a high risk. So, um, yeah, it's very important to know this. Um, so next, please. And my last example. This was a patient. Um, could you please, please go back one? Thank you. It's a case uh, you never would uh, perform a ProSigna test because it's a clear uh, case. This patient is um, HER2 positive and uh, the proliferation is high. And um, here you would recommend um, 
a therapy with um, trastuzumab, but these patients didn't respond uh, to this therapy. So the oncologist asked us to perform um, Prosigna assay, and we did. And as you can see, next please. We found out that this patient um, is a basal-like um, subtype with a low risk, and uh, this led to a change of therapy for this patient. So next, please. Yeah, to sum up, um, as we learned, it's a very robust method with a short hand-on time. We have very few dropouts because um, we always um, working with resections and normally you have uh, enough material to perform the Prosigna assay. And it is very helpful to have quality assured processes um, which guarantee short reporting times. What's very, very important is the communication between clinicians, senders, pathologists and the laboratory staff. There are many questions to be cleared before you start the assay. And um, the preliminary work should not be underestimated. And a very, very helpful information is to get this molecular subtype because um, you can sometimes identify patients um, which need a, another therapy. OK, thank you. Well, Dr. Kirshner, thank you so much for that uh, fabulously clear presentation about the, uh, the workflow that you undertake. Um, incredibly valuable. Uh, we're nearly at the top of the hour, but uh, we do have time for a couple of questions. So if it's OK with uh, you guys, I'll direct a question to, to each of you. That's all right. So uh, starting with you, Professor Peru. Um, obviously, you must have at some point realized the, the gravity and the magnitude of the discoveries that you're, uh, you were undertaking. Uh, and obviously, this has been going on for a long time now. So at what point did you realize that this the importance of what you were discovering? And then sort of following on from that, do you think intrinsic subtypes are fully understood and fully utilized clinically today? Uh, so to answer the first part of that, you know, I think it was, uh, you know, certainly from the, you know, 2000 Nature paper, I, I, I thought we were on something really good there. And, and then when we started seeing particularly the reproducibility of the prognostic uh, uh, implications, that's, that's when it said to me, you know, this is more than real. This is clinically important, and that that we should try and push this into a clinically useful task because I think it has clinical utility. Um, and and you know, to this day, we continue to evaluate, in particular now, more recently, the value of subtype uh, for therapeutic decision making, and I think you know, we're, we're gathering more and more information there. Um, I think particularly within ER positive HER2 negatives, right? Where people just go, oh, well, these are luminal cancers, but actually all the subtypes <laughs> are even basal-like types are present within ERPR positive HER2 negatives, have some basals that behave like basals. And then there's also some HER2 enriched who are clinically not her to amplify, but still have that gene expression phenotype and, and are typically of an aggressive behavior. And so I think those are, those are some of the avenues that we're pursuing now in terms of the clinical usefulness of subtype. I think it's always important to know your subtype. Look at the last example we saw, right? You're expecting something in the HER2 positive world. And again, it's like when basils show up places you don't expect them, it's surprising to everyone. And, and I think it's important to, to, to see that for both the clinician and the patient. Well, th thank you so much for that uh, very eloquent answer. I suspect we could talk for several hours on the, uh, on the yes. subject, given the opportunity. Um, Torsten, um, moving on from that and your, your developmental work, uh, taking this incredible science and turning it into a distributed test, could you, could you just describe what the, what the motivation for was in terms of making it a distributed test and, and why that's important clinically? Oh, I, uh, well, 
I think uh, as uh, Martina presented, of course, there's faster turnaround and that critical ability for the um, pathologist and the clinician to interact with the person running the molecular test because you do get unexpected results. It's best practice medicine. That's why most pathology is done at hospital labs on site by, by MDs who, who are, are directly involved in understanding the clinical questions. I think that's best practices in medicine. At a fundamental level, and partly related to that reason, that's why the um, original grant that funded, it not only funded us, it also funded a prostate, a leukemia, a lymphoma, and a lung cancer group, all to take gene profiles all the way to a distributed clinical test. Only two of those groups succeeded, by the way, um, but uh, because it's hard. But that was the mandate, uh, get FDA clearance as a distributed test so that we could do best practices medicine and best outcomes for women with breast cancer. Again, thank you. Thank you for that beautiful answer. Uh, and Dr. Kirshner, um, you obviously implemented ProSigna in your center several years ago. Um, if you were to give a single piece of advice to a center that was considering doing the same uh, or or other tips that you have, uh, would you be prepared to uh, tell, tell us what that would be? Yeah, first of all, um, you should check carefully whether the infrastructure in the lab um, is sufficient and inform yourself well about the essay, uh, advantages and disadvantages, for example. And I would also recommend uh, informing potential senders well about the requirements for the test. And that helps a lot uh, to avoid problems and open questions. Super, thank you very much. I'll take a moment now to uh, summarize what has been discussed, if I may. So first of all, a massive thank you to all three of you. I found these talks absolutely fascinating and engaging, and I'm sure the audience have as well. Uh, so thank you for your, all your insights and your participation. So whilst genomic testing is now routine for early breast cancer patients in many healthcare systems around the world globally, this webinar was designed to Keep, provide you with an insight into the decades and decades of work by hundreds of dedicated scientists and clinicians that goes into the development and implementation of such a novel and important technology. That's what we're trying to achieve here. So to summarize, we've discussed in detail the evolution of PAM50 from its conception right the way through to its clinical utilization. Uh, our esteemed panel have outlined their work. They've described the key pieces of literature that have led to ProSigna being granted its 510k clearance, which is a regulatory bar that not all assays in this space have. And we hope it's provided for you, the audience, to have the confidence in the underlying science which generates the reports, which you then use to guide your treatment decisions. We then went on to discuss how this technology can be implemented and used locally and the benefits to patients and healthcare systems a bit more broadly. In future webinars, we'll cover the, we'll move on to the clinical utilization of intrinsic subtyping with an eye on the introduction of CDK4-6 inhibitors into the early breast cancer space and more exotic pathologies. We'll talk about how to discuss and articulate risk in broad terms with patients. We'll talk about the utility of genomic testing in the no positive patients and also the economic benefits of the introduction of this technology uh, into, into a service with a, a similarly esteemed lineup of speakers that will be experts in their fields. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar and we hope you'll be able to join us again for the upcoming sessions, either live or on demand. And if you want a copy of any of the slides that have been presented, please feel free to contact us uh, via email, which is info at prosigna.com. The ProSigna assay is available and fully reimbursed in most major healthcare systems. And I hope, as you've seen, uh, has many benefits. If you want to discuss how to use or order it, uh, our contact details will be displayed shortly. And we'd be delighted to discuss that with you. Uh, and take any other questions that you may have. We recognize that switching practice is an important and difficult decision, but we hope that what has been discussed today has given you a compelling reason to do so. So to conclude, I would like to thank all of our speakers for their remarkable insights drawn from many, many years of research and practice. And most importantly, thank you, the audience, for your kind attention, active participation, uh, and we very much look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. So thank you very much.